it's minimum uh, questions of architectural quality as you already see it is organized uh, by uh, our Association for Architectural Quality Development, together with a partner, uh, Magazine Construction and uh, Architecture, and of course with our financial support, uh, the Lithuanian Council for Culture. And today we're having, um, uh, I would say, crucial question. We shall discuss uh, uh, what is the quality of uh, the indoor environment. Uh, if we can uh, accept that uh, our apartments are shrinking inevitable, also in some concern with uh, along with uh, climate crisis, but uh, it doesn't mean we have to lose its uh, indoor environment quality. Uh, so we need to know what forms uh, the optimal indoor environment uh, and design or shape our expectations accordingly. Uh, as uh, today's lecture rightly noticed, uh, meanwhile, current uh, standards for indoor environment quality, IEQ, is still described uh, with quantitative uh, those related indicators expressed in uh, numbers uh, or range of numbers for each of factors, uh, mostly uh, concerning indoor air, lighting, acoustic and thermal aspects. Um, I would say in Lithuania situation are very similar. There are many separate uh, norms regulating the environment of indoor premises, uh, one for the microclimate. This is uh, regulation only talks about um, a combination of uh, indoor air temperature, temperature differences, uh, relative air humidity, uh, and uh, air movement speed. Uh, there is also a separate regulation indicating the appropriate, appropriate uh, natural or artificial lighting uh, for a workplace. Uh, we have one more a regulate, uh, regulation uh, uh, which regulates possible temperature limits. Another one determine, determines uh, the limit values of noise, uh, but there is no big picture at all, at least that holistic picture that uh, uh, today's lecture, Professor Dr. Philomena Blyson, researchers, uh, and she, uh, as you will see, uh, proposes a new model for assessing uh, indoor environment quality, which includes other stressors and factors, uh, with a, a psychological, physiological, personal, social, etc. And I just uh, want to present uh, Philomena Blyson. Uh, she um, received her PhD in 1990 at uh, the Technical University of Denmark. Now, of course, she has uh, also uh, uh, received various degrees uh, in uh, Technical University of Eindhoven, as well as uh, the University of Rotterdam. After uh, that, she worked for more than 20 years as a researcher with Netherlands Organization for Applied Science Research, where she coordinated, uh, among other several European projects on optimization of indoor environment quality and energy use. Uh, she, in uh, 2012, was appointed full professor in the for indoor environment at the Faculty of uh, Architecture and the Built Environment uh, of the Delft University, University of Technology. Uh, what is very interesting and special about her that she uh, here at the uh, Delft University of Technology initiated the Sense Lab, 
that is a Simulab environment sponsored by 25 uh, various companies and organizations, and she make uh, a very distinct researcher there, and um, she will uh, uh, talk about it later today. Uh, in uh, 20, 2019, Blyson was appointed uh, as visiting professor at uh, Feng Chia University in Taichung, Taiwan. Uh, she also is a fellow of the International Society of Indoor Equality and Climate, of which uh, section in the Netherlands she was one of co-founders co and uh, the first president. Uh, most uh, notably, she published uh, several books, uh, wild, wild, uh, widely recognized and award-winning books. Uh, on the issue we're talking today. One is uh, the Indoor Environment Handbook, how to make buildings healthy and comfort comfortable. And another one is uh, the Healthy Indoor Environment, uh, how to assess occupants well-being in buildings. So uh, let's greet her. Uh, Philomena, do you hear us? Could you say some? word yes i hear you uh, thank um, you for this nice introduction <laughs> yes maybe i skipped something important or fresh new no no it's uh, quite enough <laughs> <laughs> thank you yes uh, so uh due uh technical issues uh we will share uh, a filmed lecture uh, maybe for some of you, uh, at the beginning, the first part uh, uh, will discuss issues you already know, but uh, please be very attentive uh, to the second part that uh, 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 where Philomena shares with her new created uh, models for the assessment of indoor environment quality. And in the second hour, you will learn about how to study and assess IEQ, indicators of IEQ, and a new research model. So let us start with answering the question, why is IEQ important? First of all, because we spend 80 to 90% of our time indoors. While most people are aware of the importance of the outdoor environment, especially in relation to climate change issues, but also related more directly to our health, the effects of indoor environmental quality are not that common knowledge. Who doesn't know by now that air pollution, such as fine dust and noise pollution are important issues? But as I just said, people in the Western world in general spend 80 to 90% of their time indoors, that is at home, school, and at the office. Exposure indoors is therefore much longer than outdoors. The second reason why IAQ is important is the fact that there are many diseases and disorders related to staying indoors. In the last decades, we are confronted with new diseases and disorders related to indoor environmental quality, such as mental illnesses, obesity, and illnesses that take longer to manifest, among which cardiovascular and chronic respiratory diseases and cancer. Think of asthma with children and COPD with adults, and then very recently COVID-19, caused by mainly airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2 indoors. If you look at the scientific outcomes, it seems that staying indoors is not good for our health, even though the conditions seem comfortable enough according to the standards we apply, according to the control strategies we have taken. This can partly be explained by the way 
our human bodies cope with the different stressors we are exposed to. We have several stress mechanisms available for that, and from research in different fields, it is clear that the relations between those stressors, those mechanisms that take place in the human body, causing the diseases and disorders, are very complex. Except for the health effects that we see today, the possible consequences for indoor environment or climate change is also a topic to be mentioned. The average outdoor air temperature is rising. Variation in weather conditions is increasing. We experience more heat waves, more heavy rainfalls, sudden wind speeds and storms. We observe an increase in smog frequency in urban areas caused by temperature rise resulting in an even more polluted outdoor air. As a consequence, we will stay even more indoors due to the air quality, smog events, but also because of these sudden heavy rainfalls and wind speeds. Next to that, the air outdoors will be hotter and more humid. The outdoor air will need to be at least cleaned and probably cooled and dehumidified before it can be used to ventilate indoors. But we would definitely like to prevent sites site like these in downtown Hong Kong, where every apartment home, and in many cases even every whole room, has an air conditioning on the outside of the facade. A third important issue is therefore the need for transition to less carbon emissions in the buildings and construction sector. The European long-term energy strategy for 2050 is focused on creating a clean planet for all, which entails reduction of CO2 emissions and using less energy by all. To be able to realize that, in 2019, it was decided in the Netherlands to retrofit buildings as such that no longer gas is used as the energy use source but all heating and cooling will have to be electric by 2050. What should be mentioned is that homes that already have been retrofitted to use less energy seem to not use less energy in real life. Behavior of people towards energy use and comfort seems to play an important role in this discrepancy. Moreover, more health problems seem to occur as a by-coming result of these retrofits. So it is clear that the major challenge of today lies in the accomplishment of a sustainable and low energy built environment and at the same time a healthy and comfortable built environment and therefore a good indoor environmental quality. Now what is indoor environmental quality? Indoor environmental quality is defined as comprising of indoor air quality, thermal quality, acoustical quality, and visual or lighting quality. Although aesthetic quality and spatial and economical quality could also be considered as being part of IAQ, I do not include them in this definition. I consider only these four factors and I will go through them to show you what each of them comprises. Let's start with thermal quality. Thermal quality, the parameter we are the most familiar with, including aspects such as feeling warm, cold, draft, etc. In our daily conversations, at least in the Netherlands in any case, we often use these to describe the weather of yesterday, today, or tomorrow. The big name most people know in this area is Professor Fang, who tested his thermal physiological model in climate chambers in the 1970s using several subjects, as you can see here on these pictures. His model has been and is still the basis for guidelines on thermal comfort. Now, thermal quality is determined by its environmental parameters, the space one is occupied or living, and the occupant who experiences the thermal quality or comfort. Let's start with the occupant. The hypothalamus in our brain takes care of the regulation of our bodily temperature. This bodily temperature 
is determined by the core temperature, the temperature of the central parts or vital organs of the human body, which is on average 37 degrees Celsius, and the skin temperature, which lies around 34 degrees Celsius. When we are cold, which is detected by cold receptors in our skin and through our blood temperature, the hypothalamus signals to our nervous system to close up our blood vessels. And we start shivering in order to decrease heat loss and increase our temperature by moving. When we feel warm, on the other hand, our body will try to cool down by opening up our blood vessels and by sweating more. Parameters that influence thermal comfort can be grouped in those related to people, such as the bodily temperatures, clothing, and metabolism, which is related to activity, and those related to the environment. For the latter, we can, for example, measure temperature, velocity, and humidity. For temperature next to air temperature, radiant temperature is just as important to account for thermal comfort. Radiant temperature is the average radiant temperature of the different surfaces in that environment. You probably have experienced yourself the heat of a fireplace standing in front of it while having a cold back at the same time. We can measure air velocity, but even better for as an indicator for draft, the turbulence, defined as the standard deviation of the air velocity divided by the mean air velocity in a certain point. An example is the ventilator, which creates both change in direction and velocity of air. And last but not least, the humidity, either in an absolute value or a percentage of water in the air at a given temperature, which is the relative humidity. A relative humidity of 100% means no more water can be vaporized. The air is saturated with that temperature. 100% will become visible, such as can be seen here, condensation on the window. With the use of all these thermal parameters and based on lab studies with many subjects who built in their thermal perception on a seven point scale, from minus three to three, when exposed to different thermal conditions, Professor Fanga defined the so-called comfort equation, which you can see here. With this comfort equation, it is possible to predict how many people will be dissatisfied with thermal, certain thermal conditions. Now, when people are dissatisfied with a certain thermal condition, they can suffer on thermal stress. Thermal stress occurs when one is not able to control its thermal balance or when one believes or perceives it is impossible. This psychological effect of expectations and perceived individual level of control are not taken into account in the model of Fanger. To deal with that, another model based on field studies of people in daily life slowly begins to win ground, the adaptive comfort model, in which the context and preferences of the occupant are considered to be important. Both of these models, however, are focused on creating thermally neutral conditions. So in that context, it is perhaps interesting to mention that recently it was found that thermally neutral conditions do not have to be necessarily healthy. Studies indicate that increased exposure to thermally neutral conditions might be related to increased adiposity, an increase of fat tissue. This was first observed in experiments with rats and later with adult men. Actually, it means that when your body doesn't have to work to feel thermally comfortable, more fat is stored. Logic, right? To control the thermal environment, several measures are possible. You can actively supply or extract heat, cooling, with basically three principles. Radiation, convection, and conduction. In the Netherlands, we are all 
we all know the radiator and the contractor. But you can also passively keep heat out or in with insulation or a solar screen or use the wind to cool. And then there are systems that use water, for example, a radiator, and there are systems that use air as the medium to transport heat, such as the convector. And the mechanical ventilation system also uses air to transport heat. Such an air conditioning system is available in different sizes and with different functions. Systems that only cool the air and dehumidify, or just only humidify or only heat the air are available. Then lighting quality. Light plays a major role in architecture. The parameter visual or lighting quality comprises of aspects such as illuminance, luminance ratios, and colors, but also aspects you would rather like to prevent, such as reflection here on a floor in a fitness center where I used to follow my aerobics lessons. But visual comfort is more than providing enough light to perform a task. Also view is an important aspect to consider. And a very important issue with lighting quality is the use of natural versus artificial lighting, especially in relation to energy use. But then also non-visual effects have been studied in relation to lighting, which I will tell you about in a few minutes. The lighting quality of a space is determined by the interplay between the sources of light, indoors and outdoors, the distribution of light in that space through geometry, and materials used and the way light is received and interpreted by the receiver. So let's start with the receiver. As receiver, we have our eyes to see. Light enters the eye via the opening in the iris, the pupil, continues through the lens and the jelly bodies before and after the lens, vitreous body, which absorb part of the light while the rest of the light falls on the light-sensitive layer, the retina. A part of the retina, the fovea, is most sensitive to light, while the blind spot corresponds to the region where the optic nerve fibers leave the eye to transfer the information to the brain, where this is interpreted. In the retina, but mostly in the fovea, we can find the light-sensitive cells, the rods and the cones. Of which the cones, we have three types, are sensitive to colors, while the rods give only achromatic light or colorless vision. Now, not so long time ago, a third type of light sensitive cell was found. These cells are distributed between the rods and the cones in the so called ganglion cells. They play a role in the control of the size of the pupil opening and the biological clock through influencing the production of the hormone melatonin by the pineal body, for which the hypothalamus is responsible. So the third light sensitive cells can also receive light, even though they are not used to see something. The so-called non-visual effects of lights on our biological clock are partly their responsibility. Now, how do they influence our biological clock? Under influence of light, the hypothalamus signals to the pineal body to produce melatonin, a hormone that makes us want to sleep. If exposed to light, night, the production of the antioxidant melatonin is immediately stopped. Alertness and core body temperature is increased and sleep is distorted. You can imagine that this might have consequences for people who work at night. Moreover, some years ago, the Dutch Health Council reported that studies have shown that people who are working night shifts are exposed to an increased risk for cardiovascular disease and diabetes type 2. Diseases and disorders of the eye can have several origins. They can be, among others, caused by genetics, by aging, or caused by external factors. Color blindness is, for example, primarily a genetic originated disorder. While with age, 
several of the eye's functions begin to deteriorate. The extent to which the pupil dilates, for example, decreases with age. And because of the smaller pupil size, older eyes receive much less light at the retina and therefore need extra light when performing a detailed task. Dry eyes, a common complaint of people indoors, is a medical condition in which the eye fails to produce tears or has an increased tear film evaporation. The most common cause of dry eyes is aging, but it can also be caused by thermal or chemical burns or, in epidemic cases, by adenoviruses. What should be noticed is that the dry eyes people often complain about indoors is rarely related to the relative humidity, but has been found to be related to pollutants in the air that cause irritation, draft, and also bad lighting. The perception of light is determined by the amount of radiation energy that enters the eye, also called the illuminance and its spectrum, the wavelengths or colors. In this picture, you see the whole spectrum of radiation or light, from cosmic radiation with a very small wavelength to radio waves with long wavelengths. In principle, light with a wavelength between 400 and 800 nanometer can reach the retina. Ultraviolet radiation, blue light, with short wavelengths, causes photochemical reactions and color the skin, while radiations with longer wavelengths, the infrared part, are experienced as heat. The visible part of the electromagnetic radiation light lies between 380 and 760 nanometer, of which 380 to 420 nanometer is colored violet, and 650 to 760 nanometer is colored red. What is interesting to know is that our eye is during the day with daylight most sensitive to light with a wavelength of around 555 nanometer, while during the night in darkness this amounts 509 nanometer. Except for colors or wavelengths of the received light, also, the amount of light or illuminance level is important. The luminance is the emitted or reflected light of a source or surface. The amount of light emitted by, for example, a bulb with a given cone is the intensity. The rate of emission is expressed in lumen, while the illuminance or the light level is defined as the amount of light expressed in lux, lumen per square meter, falling on a surface. For the light level, we know that with 20 lux, we can just notice the features of each other's faces. 200 lux is the minimum recommended level for continuously occupied space, while 500 lux should be sufficient to perform office work. But these are values for people with normal functioning eyes. And then also contrast is important for an optimal visual quality. We know two types of contrast, spatial contrast and temporal contrast. Spatial contrast is the luminance or color difference between areas that are seen at the same time that is simultaneously present in the vision field. And temporal contrast tells us something on the frequency, speed of change over time, of the change of luminance or color over time. And then flickering of light can, for example, be very annoying and even lead to headache. Although luminance differences are required to perform a certain task, if the differences in luminance are too big, those can become annoying. For example, when a person is standing with his or her back to a window, as you can see here, his or her face is difficult to distinguish due to the large luminance ratio. Even blinding can occur. And then, of course, light direction is also important, as the picture on the right clearly demonstrates. Another parameter with which we can play is the color temperature of the lighting sources applied to illuminate a space. A candle has, for example, a color temperature of around 1700 Kelvin, 
that is called warm light. A LED light can vary from 2700 to 5000 Kelvin full light, while the light from the blue sky has a temperature of up to 26,000 Kelvin. Now in this CIE 9031 color space diagram, the lines of wavelengths in nanometer with the same color temperature are presented. Because our three types of color sensors, the cones, respond to different ranges of wavelengths, this three-dimensional chromaticity diagram was developed to specify colors in practice with the luminance or brightness on the y-axis. For example, the color which is a bright color, and the, white, the color white is a bright color, while the color gray is considered to be a less bright version of that same white. Thus the chromaticity or quality of the colors white and gray are the same, while their brightness differs. And that's what this diagram shows, in fact. Now, this image shows how the spectrum of different types of lighting can differ. While daylight covers in general the whole spectrum, for artificial lighting, the cropped spectrum is smaller and show different shapes depending on the type of light. Daylight varies both in its color temperature and intensity during the day, influencing our biorhythm, as I just showed you while artificial lights usually have one color temperature, although there are LED lighting systems with which the color temperature can be changed nowadays. They are already available. Techniques for control of light can be focused on the source, natural or artificial, the direction of light and or difference in light. So it's all about assuring an as good as possible adequate light impression, which doesn't cause any complaints, such as blinding, reflection, for example, in a computer, glare, wrong light direction, for example, from below, or a sub-optimal color rendering. Lighting should support us with our daily activities and provide us with our daily amount of light we need to perform well. Ambience is part of this as well. Then acoustical quality. Acoustical quality is influenced by noise from outside, such as traffic passing by, indoors from quarreling neighbors, flushing a toilet, and by vibrations, for example, caused by wind. Noise protection, noise insulation from noise outdoors and indoors are therefore very important issues, especially because we know how important a good night's sleep is for our health. The acoustical quality of a space is determined by its sources of noise or sound, the distribution of the sound in the space, and the way the sound is received and interpreted. Let's start with that receiver. For hearing, we have our ears. No surprise. A sound enters the external auditory channel, setting the eardrum and the ossicles in motion, which transmit these vibrations to the fluid of the inner ear, where nerve impulses are transmitted via the eight cranial nerve to the brain, where it is interpreted. The Eustachian tube takes care of the pressure balance, but the inner ear also contains the equilibrium organ that acts independently of hearing activated by acceleration in space and by the rotation of the body controlled. While the equilibrium sense is sensitive to low frequencies, vibrations, the auditory sense is more sensitive to higher frequencies, so hearing. A sound is a wave motion from a sound producing object or subject. Each sound wave is characterized by its wavelengths and the frequency of the disturbance that is created. The wavelength is defined as the distance between identical phases of the propagating disturbance, as you can see here. 
the frequency is inversely proportional to the propagation time, t, of this disturbance. The distinction between loud and soft sounds is caused by the differences in magnitude of the pressure changes involved in those sound wave propagations. And that brings us to the loudness of a source of noise, which is expressed in the intensity or the sound pressure level. The unit of this quantity is the bell, but in practice it is common to use a unit 10 times smaller, the decibel. You probably have heard about that one. The sound pressure level is equal to a number of decibels above the minimum audible and is given by the equation presented here. From this equation, you can see that the minimum level is zero decibel and the maximum hearing level is 140 decibel, which at the same time is the pain limit. At that level, the vibrations of the eardrum and ossicles can start hurting and cause ruptures. Then the pitch of sound whether the sound is low or high. That is defined as the number of times per second the disturbance at any point transmitting the wave is repeated. This is expressed in the frequency with the unit hertz. In general, people feel annoyed with low pitch sounds that is between 20 and 125 hertz, while the ear is most sensitive for higher pitches between 3000 and 500 hertz. Now, the range of frequencies that can be perceived by the human ear, that is between 20 and 20,000 hertz, can be divided into so-called isophones. An isophone presents the doubling of the frequency. Because the human ear is not equally sensitive for all these different frequencies, in the evaluation of sound, the A weighting has been introduced. In the A weighting, a correction is applied per frequency range, which is subtracted from the sound pressure levels in this specific isophone. An isophone is a line at which the loudness level is constant. Now, because of the weighing, a low pitch of 40 decibel A, A weighted decibels, can then be perceived just as loud as a high pitch of 40 dB A. Now, in this figure, a number of sources and their loudness expressed in decibel A, EBA, is presented. Air conditioning and traffic as sources, I color red here, because these are the sources that are suspected to be able to cause the so-called chronic anti-stress mechanism. And let me explain that to you. First, sound has been associated with direct and indirect stress reactions. With exposure to high sound levels, we know that this can cause hearing loss, which is considered a direct effect. Uh, your ossicles can get ruptured. But also at relatively low environmental sound levels, it seems that noise can trigger the so-called anti-stress mechanism, an indirect effect in which annoyance is an important aspect. If we look into that anti-stress mechanism, we can see that in response to various stresses, such as noise, reflection, to warm to cold, an increase of secretion of anti-stress hormones can occur. On the short term, adrenaline is produced and the body is prepared for action by producing noradrenaline. If the stressor is limited in time and perceived intensity, in due time the balance is restored. So no worries there. However, with prolonged stress, so chronic stress, the production of anti-stress hormones such as cortisol is increased and the chronic imbalance in the hormones released during stress can occur. Now it has been proven, although simplified because there are other hormones and reactions involved, that cortisol plays an important role in the health effects of this chronic imbalance. High cortisol levels contribute to changes in carbohydrate and fat metabolism, 
and can lead to anxiety, depression, and heart disease, while a low cortisol production can lead to fatigue, allergies, asthma, and increased weight. These are in fact almost all the diseases and disorders I mentioned in the beginning of this lecture, as you can see. Now, when sound is produced, resulting in waves, as I explained in the beginning, it can be transferred in two ways, through the air and via the services and construction of the space. Consequently, the distribution of sound in a space can be determined by several parameters. The reverberation time, which is the time it takes for the sound level to decrease after turning off a source of sound producing 60 decibel. This is a definition. The sound insulation of the space or the attenuation of services in the space expressed in decibel, which is important for reducing sound between spaces indoors, but also for reducing sounds coming from outdoor indoors. And for determining the speech intelligibility or speech audibility in a space, how good you can hear what somebody says, background level, speech background noise ratio, and the reverberation time are important to know. So what can you do to control sound? There are several ways to control sound in a space. You can, for example, increase the absorption surface area of the space by applying porous materials, such as curtains or carpet or perforated panels, as you see here. You can, of course, apply sound insulation at the source or yourself. Headphones on your head, for example. And you can design a building as such that contact trans transmission is kept within the limits. For example, by floating floors or adding a resilient finishing layer, such as a carpet or a rubber for mainly higher frequencies. And then last but not least, indoor air quality, the fourth factor of indoor environmental quality. Indoor air quality is determined by the pollution or pollutants occupants are exposed to over time. The pollutants that can be found in that indoor air comprise of gaseous pollutants, of which some of them you can smell, for example, molds in a bathroom as shown here on the left, which, you, which can emit VOCs, volatile organic compounds that are odorous and even irritating sometimes, and other pollutants that do not smell, but are also important to consider. Think of carbon monoxide produced during cooking on a gas stove, for example. And then there are several other compounds in that indoor air which influence the air quality, such as water and particles. These particles can be of biological nature, such as house dust mite and legionella. But particles can also originate from materials. An example is shown here in the right lower corner of asbestos fibers. Now, sources of pollutants are outdoor air, such as traffic, pollen and dirt, people and their activities and products, such as cleaning, printing, building and furnishing materials, and not to forget furniture, but also what you might not expect, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems. So indoor air quality is determined by its sources, the distribution of the pollutants in the space, and how the receiver is exposed to these pollutants over time. The parameters used for the factor air are release or emission of a certain pollutant expect, expressed in microgram per second or micrograms per square meter. The concentration of the pollutant is expressed in ppm, ppb, parts per million or parts per billion, or microgram per cubic meter or milligram a cubic meter. And then we have the amount of ventilation, the airflow, supply or exhaust 
of the space in which the pollutant is being produced, which is expressed in liters per second or in cubic meter per hour. Now we perceive the air with our nose, which contains the senses with which you can perceive air quality yourself. One for smell, the olfactory sense in the olfactory epithelium, and one for irritation, the trichomonal nerve, which endings are located all over the nasal respiratory lining, forming the common chemical sense. On being stimulated by pollutants, the olfactory nerve endings and the trichomonal nerve endings send signals to the brain where the signals are integrated and interpreted. Now, the result of this process is called perceived air quality. While some people are not able to smell at all, they are called anosmic, others are able to detect certain compounds at parts per trillion, PPT level. When you breathe in air through the nose or mouth, the air enters the trachea, a long tube, which branches off into two bronchial tubes, or primary bronchi, that go to the lungs. In the lungs, the primary bronchi branch off into bronchioles, which end in the alveoli. Now, in those alveoli or alveolar sacs, the gas exchange with blood takes place. The oxygen of the inhaled air passes through the walls of the alveoli and blood vessels and enter the bloodstream. At the same time, carbon dioxide produced passes into the lungs and is exhaled. While larger particles are too heavy to stay suspended and will not be inhaled, of the sizes that can be inhaled and reach the lungs, the ultrafine or nanoparticles can together with oxygen pass the membrane of the alveoli and in this way reach our organs via our blood. And we have approximately 30 million alveoli in our lungs with a total service area of about 85 square meter available for gas exchange with blood and therefore also for these nanoparticles which is quite scary. Once in our lungs and organs, these nanoparticles can cause oxidative stress. Oxidative stress occurs when there is an excess of free radicals. They steal electrons over antioxidant defenses. Removal of electrons from cells through oxidation can create highly reactive oxygen species. Oxidative stress can damage cellular proteins, membranes, and genes, and can lead to systemic inflammation. Now, at a higher level of oxidative stress, cytotoxic effects may induce cell death. Now, by the way, oxidative stress is also responsible for burning your skin by the sun, or when too loud noise ruptures the eardrum in your ears. Nevertheless, Air pollution is probably the most important cause for oxidative stress indoors. But air pollution is responsible for more mechanisms. Air pollution can cause all sorts of health effects and can trigger several stress mechanisms. Fine dust can cause inflammation. Radon and asbest fibers can cause lung cancer. Several VOCs can cause annoyance to toxic reactions. And several ephthalates of certain plastics could cause a whole range of effects that are still hard to grasp. These are the so-called endocrine disruptors. And then not to forget SARS-CoV-2, the virus that can cause COVID-19 after inhalation of very small virus-carrying respiratory droplets. Now specific chronic respiratory diseases and disorders caused by air pollution are, for example, COPD, asthma, allergic rhinitis and hay fever. While COPD is a chronic respiratory disorder that is usually progressive and associated with an inflammatory response of the lungs, the noxious particles or gases, asthma is a permanent infection in the lungs. This means that there are always small infections present in the lungs that can cause several complaints. Asthma complaints can occur when people inhale certain compounds that trigger a response, such as several allergens, smoke, fumes, or pollution. 
Now and then allergic rhinitis is a name for an allergic reaction of the upper airways around the nose. This reaction can be caused by, also by several allergens from both biological and chemical origin. And then last but not least, hay fever is an allergic disorder. The immune system of our body overreacts to the presence of pollen coming from grass, trees, etc. So these are a whole lot of different types of respiratory diseases and disorders related to air pollution. Besides all those diseases and disorders, there are several building related symptoms that have been related to exposure of air pollutants, such as symptoms of eyes and nose, the upper airway related symptoms, tiredness and headaches. In the past, if several occupants in a building were suffering from one or more of these symptoms and no specific illness could be assigned, this was diagnosed as sick building syndrome. You might remember that. So it will be no surprise to you that an important control strategy for indoor air quality is to reduce emissions of pollutant sources as much as possible by applying source control. Source control means to prevent or minimize emissions from any possible source. Thus, using low emitting products and materials, clean and maintainable heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems, and minimizing certain pollutants to enter or being distributed in a space. That's not possible. For example, when cooking is involved or outdoor air is polluted, then you can choose to ventilate and to clean or filter the air. In this second hour, you will learn about how to study and assess indoor environmental quality. You will learn about indicators of IQ, and you will learn about a new research model. So how do we assess IEQ? The health and comfort indicators we are today familiar with can be divided in three groups of indicators. The indicators using the dose or environmental parameter, such as concentrations of certain pollutants, temperature level or ventilation rate, the ones focused on the occupant, such as sick leave or activity and number of symptoms or complaints. And indicators concerned with buildings and its components, such as certain measures or characteristics of a building and its components, or even labeling of building and its components. Now of this group of indicators, the first one, the dose or environmental parameter, is used most frequently in guidelines and standards. But the mechanisms used behind these values and ranges are not always that clear. Take for example, the minimum ventilation rate based on either carbon dioxide, CO2, as an indicator for bioinfluence or on certain emissions of building materials, minimum ventilation rates have been discussed and are still being discussed for almost 200 years now. We have no clue what to take. Even more so now during this pandemic we were in. We know that respiratory infections are caused by pathogens exhaled through the nose or mouth of an infected person. The pathogen, the coronavirus in this case, is aerosolized from sites in the respiratory tract during breathing, speaking, singing, shouting, sneezing, and coughing, forming so-called respiratory droplets. The blue particles shown in this figure are larger droplets that typically have a diameter larger than 100 microns, which fall to the floor under gravity within two meters of the source. The red particles are small droplets, also named aerosols, typically smaller than 100 microns, which can stay suspended for longer time. How long and how far a droplet can stay or travel in the air depends on the droplet size and on the local airflow conditions, like air velocity, temperature, and humidity. So from this is clear that when in close vicinity of an infectious person, the whole range of exhaled respiratory droplets 
has the potential to be transmitted. While when further away, the virus can be transmitted only by aerosols suspended in the air. This means that in theory, aerosols can be transmitted both by inhalation at short and at long range. While distancing and use of masks has been recommended to reduce the risk of short range transmission, the use of proper ventilation measures has been recommended to decrease the risk of, in particular, far range airborne transmission. This means, first of all, to provide sufficient and effective ventilation. Ventilation that ensures the supply of clean air and exhaust polluted infected air from the breathing zones of each individual person preferable without passing through the breathing zones of other persons and without recirculation of air. If general ventilation is not enough or recirculation, the use of air, the reuse of air cannot be avoided, then you can consider adding air cleaning devices. Now, ventilation can be established by just opening a window, so-called natural ventilation, or can be established by using a mechanical ventilation system varying from only exhaust to very advanced air conditioning systems that supply and exhaust the air. Mechanical ventilation gives the possibility to control the amount of air that is supplied, exhausted and or reused, while natural ventilation is an uncontrolled form and therefore a less reliable way. Natural ventilation depends on several environmental aspects, such as the wind and temperature outdoors, but also on the dimensions of the space and the possibilities of having openings in the facade. Next to the type of ventilation, also different ventilation principles can be selected, such as mixing ventilation, displacement ventilation, cross ventilation and personal ventilation. With mixing ventilation, the air pollutants are diluted and therefore reduces the number of infectious aerosols in the air. Displacement and cross ventilation move the air horizontally or vertically through a space, ideally replacing polluted air with fresh air. Begin 2020 zijn we opgeschrikt door het coronavirus die in een paar maanden tijd om zich heen sloeg en de hele wereld in zijn greep kreeg. Al snel werd duidelijk dat het virus zich via de lucht kan verspreiden wanneer besmette personen hoesten, niezen, praten of zelfs alleen maar uitademen. In de buitenlucht vervliegen de zogeheten aerosolen met virusdeeltjes zich snel en is de kans op besmetting klein. In binnenruimtes kunnen aerosolen blijven hangen en ophopen, waardoor de kans op besmetting groter wordt. In een ruimte waar meerdere personen samenkomen, is goede ventilatie essentieel om de kans op besmetting te verkleinen. Uit onderzoek weten we dat het niet alleen om de hoeveelheid ventilatie gaat, maar ook vooral om hoe je ventileert. Een besmet persoon kan onbewust, zonder zichtbare symptomen, aerosolen met virusdeeltjes verspreiden. Bij het uitademen en praten komen er kleine druppels in de lucht. De grote druppels zakken snel naar beneden, maar de kleinere druppels stijgen op en blijven in de ruimte hangen. Een mondkapje helpt om die druppels op te vangen, maar er zullen altijd kleinere druppels, ook wel aerosolen genoemd, ontsnappen aan de zij, onder of bovenkant van het mondmasker, waar de aansluitingen minder goed zijn. Bij een besmettelijk persoon zit het coronavirus in zo'n druppel. Het virus is daarom niet naakt, maar zit in een waterachtige substantie, die zouten, proteïne en andere componenten bevat. Terwijl de uitgeademde druppels een breed scala aan afmetingen hebben, de meeste liggen in de range van submicrometers tot een paar micron, heeft het coronavirus zelf een diameter van rond de 120 nanometer of 0,12 micron. De diameter van een zandkorrel is ongeveer 750 keer zo groot. Om verspreiding in de ruimte tegen te gaan en de kans op besmetting te minimaliseren, is het reduceren of ventileren van die aerosolen noodzakelijk, of je nu een mondkapje draagt of niet. 
Het weghalen van die aerosolen zou je het liefst zo dicht mogelijk bij de bron willen uitvoeren. Dat is het meest effectief, maar helaas in de praktijk niet realistisch. Ventilatie van de ruimte is dus essentieel om de concentratie van uitgeademde aerosolen in de ruimte laag te houden en zo de kans op besmetting te verkleinen. Want zonder ventilatie hopen de aerosolen in de ruimte zich op en wordt de kans op besmetting groter. Een CO2-meter kan een indicatie geven van de hoeveelheid uitgeademde lucht, zowel van besmette als niet besmette personen. Bij elke uitademing wordt er CO2 toegevoegd aan de ruimte. De concentratie van CO2 in een ruimte kan ons daarmee iets vertellen over hoeveel er geventileerd wordt. Wanneer er niet of nauwelijks wordt geventileerd, kan de hoeveelheid CO2 snel oplopen. Hoe snel die concentratie oploopt, is naast ventilatie afhankelijk van het aantal personen in de ruimte en de grootte van de ruimte. Wanneer je het aantal personen vermindert, zal de concentratie van CO2 minder snel oplopen in een niet- of nauwelijks geventileerde ruimte. Wanneer je het aantal mensen halveert in een geventileerde ruimte, zal de steady state CO2 concentratie ten opzichte van de concentratie in de buitenlucht eveneens halveren. Je kunt een CO2 meter dus gebruiken om te zien of er voldoende wordt geventileerd volgens de huidige ventilatierichtlijnen. Die richtlijnen zijn opgesteld om ervoor te zorgen dat mensen zich energiek genoeg blijven voelen om voldoende te functioneren. Echter, of die richtlijnen ook voldoende zijn om het risico op besmetting laag genoeg te houden, is nog niet bekend. Mede omdat besmetting afhankelijk is van een aantal factoren, zoals de hoeveelheid uitgeademde aerosolen met virusdeeltjes, de blootstelling van een persoon aan deze virusdeeltjes in een bepaalde tijd, de besmettelijkheid van het virus en de lichamelijke gesteldheid van de blootgestelde persoon. In ieder geval helpt ventileren de concentratie van mogelijke virusdeeltjes te reduceren. Er zijn verschillende manieren om een ruimte te ventileren tijdens een college, een vergadering of andere bijeenkomst. De meest eenvoudige manier om te ventileren is het openen van de ramen, oftewel natuurlijke ventilatie toepassen. Hierdoor vindt een uitwisseling van verse buitenlucht en de binnenlucht plaats. Als gevolg neemt de concentratie CO2 af. Nog beter is om ramen tegenover elkaar open te zetten. Hierdoor creëer je spuiventilatie. De ruimte wordt doorgespoeld met buitenlucht. Dan zal de CO2-concentratie nog verder afnemen. Als er geen ramen aan beide kanten zijn, kunnen aan één kant de ramen geopend worden en daar tegenover bijvoorbeeld een binnendeur. Een nadeel is wel dat de lucht van de gang vaak niet dezelfde kwaliteit heeft als de buitenlucht. Een veel gebruikt apparaat in de zomer is een zogeheten airco. Een airco koelt de lucht, maar er wordt dan niet geventileerd. In feite wordt de lucht hierbij hergebruikt. Dit is niet aan te bevelen, want de aanwezige besmette aerosolen worden teruggeblazen. Wetende dat het virus langer levensvatbaar blijft bij koelere, vochtige lucht, is het zeker niet aan te bevelen om in de luchtstroom van een dergelijk apparaat te zitten. Of beter nog, de airco tijdens een pandemie uitzetten, is het beste. Daarnaast zijn er ook volledige klimaatinstallaties die lucht toe- en afvoert, verwarmt, koelt en bevochtigt wanneer nodig. In veel toegepaste systemen wordt recirculatie toegepast. De lucht wordt dan hergebruikt in verband met energiebesparing. In een pandemie is hergebruik van lucht eigenlijk geen optie. Indien de lucht moet worden hergebruikt, Bijvoorbeeld in een operatiekamer waar de lucht super schoon moet zijn, wordt de lucht gefilterd voordat deze weer wordt ingeblazen. Hiervoor worden voornamelijk HEPA-filters toegepast die zelfs de allerkleinste deeltjes kunnen afvangen. Een optie is om een mobiel HEPA-filtersysteem aan de ruimte toe te voegen die in staat is om aerosolen met virusdeeltjes uit de lucht te halen. Dit kan echter voor veel lawaai zorgen en vaak zijn er in grote ruimtes meerdere systemen nodig om alle aerosolen af te vangen. We weten namelijk niet wie er besmet is en er kunnen meerdere besmette personen aanwezig zijn. Dat neemt niet weg dat deze maatregel als tijdelijke oplossing zou kunnen dienen naast het regelmatig openen van de ramen en deuren. Want ventileren blijft noodzakelijk. Natuurlijk ventileren is echter moeilijk controleerbaar en afhankelijk van het aantal te openen ramen, de buitenluchttemperatuur en de winddruk op de gevel. Bovendien is het openen van de ramen in de winter een aanzienlijk minder fijne maatregel. 
In de winter heeft mechanische ventilatie daarom de voorkeur. Bij mechanische ventilatie wordt verse lucht toegevoerd en of afgevoerd via een mechanisch systeem. Onder de vorm van ventilatie vallen verschillende principes. Bij mengventilatie wordt schone lucht toegevoerd vanuit het plafond of er net onder, waarna deze zich mengt met de verontreinigde lucht in de ruimte en wordt afgevoerd via openingen in het plafond of de wanden. De CO2-concentratie zal hierdoor afnemen. Bij verdringingsventilatie wordt de lucht vanuit de vloer met een lage snelheid ingebracht, zodat er geen tocht ontstaat. Die lucht wordt opgewarmd door de warme luchtlaag rondom de aanwezige personen, de zogeheten thermische pluim, en stijgt naar boven, waar deze via openingen in het plafond of er net onder wordt afgevoerd. Bij de meest perfecte verdringingsventilatie zullen alle omhoog bewegende aerosolen naar boven worden afgevoerd en niet mengen met de in de ruimte aanwezige lucht. Samen met het gebruik van mondkapjes die de grote druppels tegenhouden, kan deze vorm van ventilatie in theorie tot een aanzienlijke daling van het risico op besmetting leiden. De coronapandemie laat zien wat het belang van ventilatie is in de strijd tegen virussen. Ook al is er meer kennis nodig over hoe potentiële ziekteverwekkers zich verspreiden in gebouwen, wat de beste condities en manieren zijn om ze te bestrijden, op de juiste manier ventileren lijkt een belangrijke verdediging tegen de pandemie. Het is duidelijk dat het niet alleen gaat om de vraag welke ventilatiehoeveelheden zijn er nodig, maar ook hoe er moet worden geventileerd in verschillende situaties. Het is belangrijk dat hoe we ventileren heroverwegen, vooral in druk bezette ruimtes waar mensen voor een langere tijd verblijven. Zoals bijvoorbeeld in klaslokalen, kantoortuinen, restaurants, verpleeghuizen, theaters, sportclubs, etc. Onderzoek is nodig. Samenwerking tussen epidemiologen, virologen, aerosolen-experts, bouwkundige ingenieurs, architecten, gedragspsychologen en installatiedeskundigen is hierbij onmisbaar. Now, the key question that arose during the COVID-19 pandemic was how much ventilation is required. This is not an easy question to answer. Current guidelines for air quality indoors are based on the CO2 concentration in air that is allowed. CO2 is used as an indicator for the presence of people. With every breath we take, we exhale CO2. With the equation shown here, it is possible to calculate the required ventilation rate per person in a space to keep below the allowed CO2 concentration. The air distribution effectiveness in that equation tells us something about how effective the air is distributed. For complete mixing, this value is 1. When we use natural ventilation, opening windows, single-sided or two-sided, This effectiveness can vary depending upon the temperature differences, wind direction, and dimensions of the space. Now, assuming a limit of 1200 ppm, an outdoor concentration of 400 ppm, and a seated adult producing 18 liter CO2 per hour, this would result in a required ventilation rate of 6.25 liters per second per person for a ventilated room with an effectiveness of 1 and twice as much for a room with an effectiveness of a half. Whether these values are enough to prevent transmission, we don't know. It clearly not only depends on the amount, but also on how it is ventilated, the distribution of the air and position of sources as well as local ventilation efficiencies. Also, to then estimate what the risk would be to get sick from exposure to a certain pollutant or a virus is still difficult, which is not strange considering all the interactions that take place at human level. It is clear that the relations between the stressors, the mechanisms that take place in the human body, causing the diseases and disorders, are very complex and are very much depending on personal factors and interactions with the environment in a certain situation. Then, 
interactions with the environment can cause additional unwanted effects or even interfere with the primary effect. Increasing ventilation by opening a window can introduce noise from outdoors and can introduce the cold air during, for example, the winter time. But also in situations with a mechanical ventilation system, problems with noise from the increased airflow in the ducts, the so-called rustle of the air, can increase when systems are put on their max possible airflow for as much ventilation as possible. Not to speak about the drafts this can cause. What is important not to forget is that infectious aerosols or respiratory droplets are not the only possible pollutants present in a space. Think of emissions of constructions and furnishing materials, the outdoor air, pollutants originating from bad maintenance of ventilation systems, and not to forget all those volatile organic compounds and particles that are released during the many activities we, the occupants, perform at home, the office, school, and so on. Those pollutants can interact with each other, indoor chemistry, they can interact with other pollution sources, up and desorption, and they are influenced by ventilation, both mechanical and natural. We are dealing with a complex mix of pollutants that is not stable over time. So let's have a look at the other two groups of indicators we have available, the occupant-related indicators and the building-related indicators. The occupant-related indicators comprise of indicators related directly to the occupant, such as symptoms and complaints. The number and times of symptoms and or complaints from occupants of a building administered via a questionnaire has been the most applied method to assess the health and comfort status of an occupant in a building. Questions related to symptoms, such as for example shown here, can be used to calculate the percentage of occupants with a certain symptom, or even the number of symptoms per occupant defined as the building symptom index. But people have also been directly asked how they experience their environment by, for example, mood profiling, developed by Peter Desmet, a professor at Industrial Design of our university. Or by a question such as this one, how acceptable is the air you perceive? With the answers, the percentage of dissatisfied or acceptability percentage of a group of people can be calculated. The latter type of questioning is, for example, also used in lab studies where panels of persons have been used to evaluate air quality, for example, from an air filter, as shown here, to get an idea of how a single component is performing. That brings us to productivity, performance. Productivity has been and can be measured in different ways. Objectively, by, for example, measuring the speed of working and the accuracy of outputs by designing very controlled experiments with well-focused tests. Subjectively, by using self-estimated skills and questionnaires to assess the individual opinions of people concerning their work environment. And with combined measures, using, for example, some psychological measures such as brain rhythms to see whether variations in the patterns of the brain responses relate with the responses assessed by questionnaires. This figure here shows an increased blood flow when a man is finding his way in a virtual environment, as an example of an experiment using combined measures. Other physiological and physical indicators are also thinkable, indicators that give us information on changes in physics or behavior, for example, of breathing, allergic reaction, and blood pressure. Changes in our bodily products, such as breath, urine, blood, and saliva, of certain hormones or other compounds that are more or less present, for example, cortisol. Anti-stress hormone we produce when exposed to stress situation, as I explained before. Changes in the brain, monitored, for example, with a precision emission tomography scan, so-called PET scan, and changes at cell level with techniques Techniques such as gene profiling are also showing potential 
as an indicator to be used. And let's look at the group of building related indicators. Also with respect to building related indicators, we haven't sit still. Two types of building related indicators can be distinguished. Labels of some kind to compare buildings or components and examples of good practice. While energy labels are getting more and more effect, pushed by regulation via the Energy Performance Directive of Buildings, labeling or evaluating buildings on its health and comfort effect is still very much a voluntary event. Even though the market offers us now several building evaluation tools, such as BREEAM in the UK, LEED in the USA and CASB in Japan, it is still not common to apply these tools. Driven by the fact that also those tools are mostly focused on sustainability and not on health and comfort of occupants in the buildings, the later introduced well standard, which does include health and comfort in their assessment, is beginning to win ground. Then we also have collected many examples of good practice over the years for which potential problems have been established, expressed in, for example, checklists that can be applied during inspection of a building. As you can see here, some examples of correlations. And based on experience, we have established relation schemes that can help us to identify potential risks of the measures we take to tackle a problem trying to prevent us from creating new problems. So, then to get back to our current standards. Current standards such as maximum concentrations of certain pollutants, ventilation rate and temperature ranges are mainly based on single dose response relationships. We assess indoor environmental quality, whether a building is healthy, on effect modeling. Now, this works well for health-threatening exposures for which a clear dose-response relationship has been determined. But complexity, number of indoor environmental parameters, and lack of knowledge make a total performance assessment using only threshold levels for single parameters difficult and sometimes even meaningless. So according to the standards, a healthy building is a building that complies with the existing standards and guidelines for mainly the environmental or dose related indicators. However, from the previous, it's clear that in order to assess whether a building is healthy, more is needed. A healthy building is in fact a building that has the means to support the physical, psychological and physiological health and comfort of its occupants over time. A healthy building has the means to influence health and comfort of its occupants through the thermal, lighting, acoustical and indoor air quality of the indoor environment. So it's clear that next to the dose related indicators, we need to also make use of the occupant related indicators, providing information on the effects of stress and preferences and needs, preferable at individual level because people differ and situations change over time. People differ in their preferences and needs, influenced by psychological, physiological, personal, social, and environmental factors and stressors. We are exposed to a mix of stressors that can change over time, and our responses, the coping and the effects, are influenced by genetics, previous exposures, and interactions between those stressors at human level. From research in different fields, it's clear that, that these interactions at human level that occur through the mechanisms that take place in the human body to cope with the different stressors causing the diseases and disorders are very complex. This complexity actually starts already with perception and the interpretation of what our senses perceive in our brain. During perception with our senses, interactions of different environmental stressors, smell, sight and hearing at brain level, the central nervous system, might occur. Now, to be able to test and experience both single and combination of environmental conditions with our senses, 
the sense lab was created. The sense lab comprises of the experience room and four test chambers. In principle, one for each of the four environmental factors light, sound, air, and thermal aspects. And the experience room, and the experience room. While the test chambers only have mechanical air supply, the experience room, a room for integrated perception of IAQ, has the possibility for two mechanical ventilation regimes, mixing and displacement ventilation, different lighting patterns, and the creation of sound. The experience room is made of glass with internal interchangeable panels, operable windows, a computer floor, and a lowered ceiling. In this setup, the experience room, as you can see, is furnished as a classroom. Now, in this experience room, we performed a study with in total 335 primary school children to test the main cross-modal and interaction effects on the evaluation of temperature, noise, light, and smell. Those children were exposed to 36 different combinations of environmental conditions in the experience room of the sense lab, as pointed out here. The results showed, first of all, that more acoustical panels had a positive effect on the children's assessment of sound, as expected. But next to that, also a clear influence of fewer acoustical panels on children's evaluation of smell, draft, and light was found. And what was most interesting is the finding that when children were exposed to the sound type, children talking, their assessment of both sound and smell, while well, no smell was added, was affected, indicating that children are perhaps preconditioned in their response by hearing children talk. Next to the occupant-related indicators, we also need to make use of building-related indicators and their interactions that occur in the indoor environment over time, influenced by behavior of the occupants and the environmental changes that occur. Interactions such as, for example, chemical interactions between pollutants in the air and microbiological growth at indoor surfaces, but also interactions between the different parameters such as light and thermal aspects, when sunlight heats up the interior surfaces, between thermal conditions and indoor air, when emission rates, we know that emission rates of most VOC increase with increasing temperature. Also the interactions between acoustics and indoor air, via the introduction of ventilated air by mechanical ventilation systems, which can produce equipment as well as airflow noise, or via natural ventilation through opening the windows, bringing in the noise produced outdoors indoors. It's clear that indoor air quality, thermal environment, acoustics and illumination are all interconnected in that indoor environment, and we have to deal with that. So what do we need? It's clear we need a different view on indoor environmental quality. A view in which for different scenarios, possible problems, interactions, people and effects are all accounted for, focusing on situations rather than single components. A view in which not only the quantitative dose-related indicators expressed in number and or ranges of numbers for each of the factors indoor air, lighting, acoustics, and thermal aspects are used, but all stresses and factors, whether of psychological, physiological, personal, social, or environmental nature, whether positive or negative. Clearly, there's a need for another research model. We are dealing with individuals in different scenarios, such as homes, offices, and schools, and situations. For example, sitting behind a desk in a meeting room, on the phone, or at the computer. We are dealing with several stressors and their integrated effects over time. And we're dealing with interactions 
between those stressors in complex real life exposure situations at environmental level. And we are dealing with interactions between various body responses at human level. Next to this new research model, it is important to consider other assessment methods and indicators. Other indicators that can be related to health and comfort of occupants in order to turn the negative effect around into a positive experience. It is clear that methods focused on the control of single environmental factors with the so-called dose or environmental indicators are not enough. We have two categories of indicators that can be used. In the category of occupants, the emphasis should be on indicators that can give us information on the effects of stress. Indicators that can tell us something on changes in the bodily systems and experience, preferences and needs of people. In the category building and its components, certain measures or characteristics of a building can be used. To validate this new model, several field studies have been performed to determine patterns of stressors and preference and needs profiles of occupants. You can see the list here, including also the journal papers in which they were published. And you can look them up later. The collection methods for these studies comprised of a checklist to collect the building related stressors per scenario and the questionnaire among the occupants to collect information on all possible stressors effects, preferences and needs of the occupants. To determine patterns of positive and negative stressors, multivariate analysis to find patterns was performed on the data collected. For determining profiles of occupants, two steps cluster analysis was performed. Now, multivariate analysis to find patterns was performed so far for several studies. 467 office buildings in the Office Air project 2012, for 399 student homes in 2015, for 45 classrooms studied in the school study of 2070, and for 556 employees of outpatient areas in six Dutch, Dutch hospitals in 2019. Now, for each study, the collected building related indicators associated with the occupant related indicators. To give an example, for the 399 student homes, the multivariate analysis showed that biological pollutants caused by pets, chemical pollutants caused by MDF on less than one year old furniture in the bedroom, ventilation, opening windows in bedroom more than once a week, and personal factors like working out were associated with having rhinitis in students. This is clearly a good example of the multiple stressors related to having rhinitis, and thus the importance of considering all possible stressors when studying a certain disease or disorder. For determining profiles of occupants, two steps cluster analysis was performed for office workers in the Netherlands in the Office Air project, for school children of primary schools, for staff of outpatient areas and hospitals, and for office workers in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic. And they were all based on comfort, health, and preference and needs of the occupants. For example, in the school study performed in the spring of 2017, six clusters, which is profiles of school children were determined based on their personal characteristics, health status, and preferences for IEQ. Among them, four clusters of children had specific concerns related to the IEQ factors, the sound concerned cluster, the smell and sound concerned cluster, the thermal and draft concerned cluster, and the light concerned cluster. However, the other two clusters of children did not show a specific concern. The all concerned cluster was concerned about all IEQ factors in the classroom, while the nothing concerned cluster did not show any concern. Additionally to the studies I listed before, since 2015, first year bachelor students of the Faculty of Architecture in the Built Environment are asked to complete the so-called HOME questionnaire. 
His questionnaire comprises of questions on personal factors such as age and gender, questions on your health and comfort, questions about the building you live in, its surroundings, the occupants and their activities, possible water problems that occur or have occurred, questions about materials, furnishings and furniture that they have, and the possibilities of ventilation. From the responses of the students in the year 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019 and 2020, two-step cluster analysis of self-reported indoor environment related complaints resulted in three clusters. A cluster with the most symptoms and the least diseases, a cluster with average symptoms and diseases, and a cluster with the least symptoms and the most diseases. After that, multivariate analysis per cluster for the diseases, rhinitis and migraine, and the building related symptoms, stuffy nose and headache, was performed. The outcome showed that the patterns of stressors and risk factors can differ per cluster. Moreover, in case of an overlap in response, the associated stressors for one cluster can have a positive effect, while for another cluster a negative effect. From that outcome, we concluded that clustering is also important for determining health effects caused by multiple stressors in the built environment, especially for diseases and symptoms that are not frequently occurring. So from all these studies, it is clear that we're dealing with the combined effects of several stressors on people over time. We are dealing with interactions at and between different levels, human and environmental, as well as the dynamic preference and needs of occupants in different scenarios and situations. It is important to take account of the combined effects of stress factors in buildings on people, as well as their individual preferences and needs, and interactions occurring both at environment and human level over time. So to summarize both lectures. First, of all, from the first lecture, it is clear that we know a lot about the factors and parameters of the indoor environment, and we have defined over the years a number of control strategies per parameter to keep them under control, to prevent or cure different related observed physical health effects. In other words, to find solutions for thermal quality, lighting quality, sound quality, and air quality separately. Exposure to the different environmental stressors, indoor air, lighting, acoustics and thermal aspects, can cause discomfort and symptoms to the different senses we have to detect these stressors. And those stressors can cause different diseases and disorders. Now, in the second lecture, I showed you that although research has shown that the conditions seem to comply with current standards for indoor environmental quality based on single dose response relationships, staying indoors is not good for our health. It is clear that methods focused on the control of single environmental factors with the so called dose or environmental indicators are not enough. We have two other categories of indicators that can be used, the occupant related and the building related indicators. To finally conclude, we need to acknowledge the fact that we are dealing with people who are different in their needs and preferences, and that the indoor environmental quality is more than the sum of its parts. With regards to understanding the indoor environment, its occupants and effects, the challenge of the future lies, to my opinion, in unraveling the effects of change 
and interactions both at human and environmental level, which includes also the effects and consequences of climate change. Thank you for listening. Oh, okay, because it seems like sound disappeared. Okay. Uh, uh, we already have uh, a question for you, uh, but uh, let me start with my question. Uh, with uh, climate crisis uh, in mind and the likelihood uh, of the increased frequency of heat waves or floods, according to you, uh, what are the biggest threats for the indoor environment and uh, what are the main requirements uh, for the building related indicators uh, in order to ensure comfortable living and working uh, environment in the future? Thank you for, for this uh, interesting question. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, I think um, that we really need to look into that more carefully. If you ask me personally, what do I think we should focus on? I would think ventilation, mechanical versus natural um, indicators that can help us to solve that issue. Now, I foresee uh, bigger problems with that. Now, corona was just uh, a warning, I think, uh, but we need to, to make ourselves ready for that in the future. Uh, we, it will be hotter, so we would need cooling more often, but also the outdoor air pollution uh, will be increasing worse. Uh, if we stay more often indoors and we also get uh, to deal with uh, viruses as corona in the future more often, we definitely also need to focus on indoor air quality much more than we already uh, try to do now. Because it uh, looks uh, to me that uh, a mixed ventilation is uh, one of the way to ensure a good quality of uh, indoor air, but- uh, uh, I, I, I don't agree. Uh, um, I, I think it depends very much on the situation you're in. If you are in your room alone, mixing ventilation is okay. So you reduce the pollutants in the air uh, by mixing ventilation. But when you are in an, in a classroom, for example, uh, if you mix uh, the air, the, the children next to you uh, or the people next to you will have a, a bigger chance of getting infected uh, than if you would uh, immediately exhaust this uh, polluted air uh, when, when we talk about infections. Uh, as such. So in, in rooms with, with lots of people crowding, we really need to reconsider the way we ventilate. Mixing ventilation is not the ideal option. Uh, also cross ventilation is not the ideal option. So opening windows, it's just uh, a fast solution to clean the air. But if you are sitting in the room with all these people, uh, you need to have another type of ventilation. And in that sense, displacement ventilation is, is a much better form, which is already used in, in many um, theaters, for example, and, uh, where you are uh, sitting. Um, you, you might have experienced that yourself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, so we have a question from Jurgita Shinkaitene. How to find a compromise in the work environment as library or museum. I mean, we need a dry environment for things like books, but we need also more humidity for people. 
Uh, can you repeat the first line? Uh, uh, how to find a compromise in the work environment as library or museum. When you know, uh, uh, yes, uh, yeah. this artifact. Uh, yes, yes, I, I understand that. Um, but this this is a particular situation where you have to, to deal with that. So locally, uh, climatization is, is in that case the best option to use. And so if you as a person would like to have a higher humidity, um, than the books, which I doubt actually, because uh, a humidity be between 40 and 60 percent is also good for books, right? As long as you keep it constant. This is, this is what I've heard about artifacts, but um, what I see in museum in, is that they, uh, if it's really about an old book or an old artifact, they separate and they climatize it locally and make sure that the air in the room is not uh, connected with the air in, in the enclosed space of that artifact. Mm -hmm. So uh, you really have to look each time for situation, what is the best solution for this? Uh, I wonder actually uh, like the same uh, question, but concerning uh, the different uh, needs and preferences of the occupant yeah. as you mentioned when you are alone in the room it's one case but uh, when there's yeah. plenty of uh, different people how to uh, optimize this uh, indoor quality well th this this is something that that's why we we have uh, developed this method uh, to profile uh, we were uh, of course you cannot have uh, if you have uh, 300 people in one room uh, in one building you cannot create for each individual a different IAQ in, in, in indoor environment. Uh, so that's why we uh, we analyzed these data that we got to see if we could cluster people with similar preferences and needs. So you can also design your your building in that way. If you, like for example, the, the school study showed that there are six profiles approximately. So you could design uh, for that maybe. Um, if that's if you have a room with with all these six profiles in one room, you would need to go for local uh, climatization again, local indoor environmental quality. So to provide the means to to control your own light and to make sure that you're not bothered by acoustics or uh, by providing them. Uh, means to do that. Uh, all these different aspects or, or heating, uh, thermal comfort, you can also locally provide means to do so. It already exists. I think of, uh, of, of automobiles where we can really uh, already in the seat uh, arrange this uh, by heating up your chair or by having a local ventilation um in, into your face uh th this is all possible so I, I think that's where we are going to uh, more and more especially in working environments uh, maybe there's someone else wanted to ask something please use this opportunity it's one time in life opportunity <laughs> um uh, uh, I would like I also you mentioned uh, uh, the relation between uh, taking measures and uh, lead, uh, leading possibility to failure. In I wonder, for example, if you make or have any calculation on based on percentage, how much, for example, solar protection used to reduce uh, overheating decreases daylight efficiency. Do you have such calculations? No, I don't have that. <laughs> no, my, my research is uh, purely focused on, so far, on, on people and the effects that the environment has on people and, and vice versa. And so how to, uh, if we do something with the indoor environmental quality or if people do something with the indoor environment, what happens with, with, uh, with the conditions? That's what we are focused on. We have hardly looked at the effects on, on solar energy or efficiencies. 
uh, I wonder, I don't know, maybe I misunderstood, but uh, I noticed that in your uh, research model based on scenario uh, concerning the thermal building uh, related indicators, you omitted uh, the uh, that one. I mean, you omitted the thermal uh, issue. Is it uh, on purpose? I don't think I omitted that, but if so, then that is a mistake. No, I mentioned thermal ah. air quality, indoor air, uh, lighting and acoustics. Yes, I mentioned them all. So thank you. Oh, OK, OK, maybe, yeah. maybe. we can check. <laughs> yes, no, not they should be included. Um, what, what I also would like to add is that, well, my, um, the model is, is not only focused on comfort. And so it's also very much uh, focused on, on the needs of people. Uh, and the, uh, for example, the, the exposure to, to sounds uh, that, that I showed, uh, even moderate sounds can have a health effect that we are not aware of. Uh, and these kind of things, we, we need to make sure that we prevent from occurring. Uh, this, this is one effect, but also things in the air, which we can't see, we can't smell, but still have an effect. That's what I consider a need. Now then preferences, preferences can be related to needs. Uh, for example, um, I always give the example of, of my husband and I who were sitting in this office next to, in, in the opposite of each other. Uh, as soon as the sun comes in, he closes the curtains because he doesn't like to have the sun in his eyes. It hurts his eyes, he says. And he has a medical condition that explains that. Now, I, on the other hand, I want as much light as possible. So when the sun comes in, I really love it because my eyes need more light. That's also a medical condition that I, I, I found out. And so there, there are connections between what you, uh, what you prefer and what your medical status actually requires. And, and these are the kind of things that we are looking for in these occupant related indicators in relation to building related indicators and those related indicators. And that's what we are trying to, to figure out. Great. Uh, actually, we are already behind the timeline. Uh, take the last chance to ask uh, Philomena. Everyone is quite astonished of so much data. <laughs> Presenter. Yes. Presenter, thank you once more, uh, Philomena, for uh, being with us. Thank you so much Thank for having you. me. Yes, and I guess uh, uh, we will come back not once for your uh, knowledge. And yes. uh, I encourage uh, everyone to uh, read these books as they are uh, really profound and useful, especially for architects. Uh, 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 the information about our next lecture. Tai grįžtų tada į lietuvių kalbą ir noriu prieš atsisveikindama tiesiog pauno ansuoti ketvirtąją mūsų ciklo paskaitą, kurią skaitys architektas urbanistas Donatas Baltrušaitis. Kaip matote, grįžtame jau iš uždarų erdvių į miestą, kurio Erdvės viešosios taip pat traukėsi ir tiesiog klausim kartu su Donatu, kas kūrė gyvybę mieste ir kokie turėtų būti gyvybingos urbanistinės struktūros parametrai. Kaip matote, gyvūžės 24-ą lauksime visų, o atsisveikinu šiandien su visais. Ačiū, kad buvo.